Um, our, our next talk is going to be uh, from Simon Lloyd on the on first piece of intensity data from the new proto-result of the mineral implications for inner core motivation and age. Hi, okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I hope so. Okay, can anyone hear me? <laughs> Yes, yeah, no, problem. no problem. And I can see the projection. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, hi, I'm Simon Lloyd from the University of Liverpool, and I'm presenting the first paleo intensity data to come from the cryogenian and discussing their potential implications for inner core nucleation age. And so, the aim of the study was to help reduce the large uncertainty in the estimates for inner core nucleation age. And we want to do this because not only is the formation of the inner core a significant event in Earth history, but also knowledge of when it occurred would provide an invaluable constraint on models which aim to solve other deep Earth problems. And so we can do this with paleo intensity, we believe, because the formation of the inner core brought about two new power sources to help drive the geodynamo, compositional convection, and the subsequent release of latent heat. And so we'd expect to see an increase in intense intensity observations at Earth's surface and or a change in the time average morphology of the field. And so if we look at models, the most recent models to predict age estimates, uh, we've got observational based models such as those on the left and geodynamo models on the right. And we can see that the age estimates here span more than 500 million years, but that they all fall in or around the Neoproterozoic era. And so far it's been difficult to link paleomagnetic observational data and the outputs from geodynamo simulations. However, this has been a key aim of the deep group at Liverpool over the last few years. And there's some exciting new papers to come out of this research. An important caveat though, is that despite significant advances in geodynamo simulations, estimates remain based on uncertain parameters such as thermal conductivity. And so this is why paleo intensity observations are vital as a constraint on these models. And so if we look at the Neoproterozoic in more detail, this cartoon represents geological history from 4.6 billion years ago, clockwise to the present day and we've highlighted the Neoproterozoic. And if we now populate this with all the current paleo intensity data we have, we see that there's just four single data points in almost 500 year, million years of Earth history. And for context, these have been plotted in relation to the present air field, where the surface of the Earth there would be no field at all. But the takeaway message from this is that the most recent age estimates coincide with a severe paucity of data in the Neoproterozoic. And so that's what this study aims to help with by looking at rocks from high Arctic Canada and Greenland. So if we zoom in on that area, we've been looking at rocks from the Franklin Large Igneous Province, an event which took place around 720 million years ago and covered a vast area, almost, well, over 2 million square kilometers including dikes, sills, volcanics, and intrusives. However, we're focused mainly on dikes from Ellesmere Island, Devon Island, and Greenland. And this is based off previous work by Denison et al. in 2009, who sampled almost 30 dolerite dikes and two sills, and they obtained uranium lead ages from the same rocks as they acquired primary remnants from. And the directions of the Franklin event are well defined across an expansive area. They include reverse polarity directions and a positive bake contact test. And so this is all important prerequisites to paleo intensity reliability. And this study focuses on 16 dolerite dikes and one sill. And we obtained 120 of the original one inch samples, which we then cut in half to produce 240 half inch samples. And so we started off by measuring the rock magnetic properties of representative samples from each of the sites. And we measured hysteresis loops, high temperature susceptibility, magnetization saturation, and isothermal remnant magnetization. 
And we also did a viscous remnant magnetization experiment in which we oriented the samples in different positions in the Earth's field. And from that, we were able to measure the viscous component. And then we separated our sites according to high or low viscous component. We also did some limited scanning electron microscopy. And here, if we look at the top two images, we see very fine low titanium titanomagnetite grains, which appear pristine compared to the bottom two images where we see much larger grains with ilmenite and low titanomagnetite with evidence of alteration. And so if we look at the rock magnetic results, in the top left, we have a day plot where we can see that most of the sites fall in the PSD or vortex bulk domain state region. And next to that, we see our MST curves, which we separated according to reversibility at room temperature. However, these tell us that we have a single Curie temperature ranging from 550 to 590 degrees Celsius, which we interpret as low titanium titanomagnetite. And we see a range of reversibility in the uh, KT curves. So the top row of KT curves are the more reversible and the bottom row are less reversible. And we also see evidence of low temperature inflections at around 300 degrees C. And so we took a multi-technique approach to gathering paleo intensity results. We used three methods, the thermal telier method, the microwave method and the sure double heating technique with and without low temperature demagnetization. And the su success rates are next to the methods there. And we see that the thermal Tellier method didn't do so well, predominantly due to failure of PTRM checks due to alteration. And so the big feature from our results is that the field was extremely weak at this time, almost an order of magnitude weaker than today. And so we got, we, used, we got results from three methods, almost 40 results from 11 sites. However, four of the sites had less than three results. So we don't use these in our calculation of virtual dipole moments. You also note we get a low site mean standard deviation in absolute terms of less than three microteslas. And if we look at some of the array plots, here each column represents a different method and each row is the, is represents uh, the same site. So in this way, we're able to compare sister specimens across method. And we can see that we get consistent results in absolute terms within and between sites and from all three methods. For example, the bottom row site BP, we get 5.3 microteslas, 6.7 and 7.4, each from a different method. And we can also see that uh, there are some two slope array plots present. However, a change in slope usually corresponds to a change in direction. And that's most notable in the top middle uh, array plot. So we also compare our rock magnetic results and our paleo intensity results. And we find these in good agreement because all sites which show high viscous components, we get no paleo intensity results for. And the less reversible KT curves and or low temperature inflections, we also get no paleo intensity results for. And so the successful paleo intensity results are associated with sites displaying the highest quality rock magnetic properties. We also look at uh, the potential for any bias from multi-domain effects. And we do this because of the two slope array plots and also the PSD uh, domain state properties. And so we do this by comparing sure low temperature demagnetization results with those that did not undergo any LTD. And that's because LTD is said to remove, preferentially remove MD-like remnants. <clears throat> so if we look at the plot in the bottom left, uh, we've got sister samples from six different sites where the blue columns are the LTD and the orange columns are no LTD. And we see that the results are almost equivalent. So this suggests that we don't have any bias from MD effects. We also looked at the two slope array plots, uh, particularly where a change in direction was less obvious. And we changed the best line fit considerably. And we found that a large change in slope 
actually corresponds to a very small absolute change in intensity. So if there is any effect from MD, we think it's minimal. We also scored our results using the QPI system from Biggin and Patterson 2014 and our site score between five and nine. And so if we look at our results and compare them with uh, current global data, our results are in are the uh, green squares. And we've selected data here with a QPI score of three or more and an N of three or more. And some observations we can make from this. Uh, but firstly, it's important to note the Precambrian studies may not be representative of the very long term average because they may capture a temporally or spatially limited anomaly. However, we've produced seven VDMs from four to 19 zeta amp meters squared, which are consistent with an inner core that had yet to form. However, we note a severe paucity of um, paleo intensity data remains. We can also see that our new data fit well on the polynomial fit provided by Bono et al in 2019, which is highlighted as the dashed orange line. And we also noted that our data, our results support low field observations prior to the onset of three Phanerozoic supercrons, suggesting a possible quasi periodicity in dipole strength. And we can see that in this image where you can, you can see that there are, there are lows preceding each of the three supercrons in the Phanerozoic. So in summary, we've reported the first paleo intensity results in a mid neoproterozoic 300 million year gap in global records. And our results are consistent within and between site and method ranging from one to 10 microteslas. Seven VDMs are determined ranging from four to 19 zeta amp meters squared. And that's compared to the present air field of around 80 zeta amp meters squared. And they're associated with high QPI scores between five and nine. And although many more reliable paleo intensity data are needed for a more meaningful analysis, these new data are consistent with an inner core that had yet to form. That's it, thanks. It's probably quite short. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. That was very interesting. Uh, oh, my camera's up there. There we go. <laughs> um, oh yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I have a quick... I haven't seen if anyone else has any questions. I'll ask them in a minute, but I have a question for you. Um, are, have you compared the work you've done to, or have you come across the work of Roman uh, Velofsky? In, um, he's in Moscow State, in obviously in Russia. And he's been working on the, uh, on the Kola Peninsula for the last several years. Um, uh, and I know that the age range of intrusions that he has quite a lot of PMAC data collected from covers the interval that, that you're describing here. And it might be an interesting comparison. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it doesn't ring a bell to me now because the only data I know of that's published is, is the stuff I've just shown. Yeah, I, I, like I'm not sure if it is the exact, you know, the, the exact same ages, but it certainly is, it certainly is flanking or, or the range that he's working in is beyond the range, you know, covers the range that you're, you're, you're in as yeah. well. So you might be um, quite a friendly guy. Might be, might be a good idea to um, see if you can touch base with him. I, I have his presentation from EGU uh, last year, if you want to have a look at it. Yeah. Later on, I'll send it your way. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, sorry, I should have asked, does anyone else have any other questions? No? OK, that's, that's fair enough. Um, thank, Actually, thank you very well, much. Can I, can I ask okay. a question? Sorry. Yeah, Richard, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering how, what the latest uh, state of play is on, on whether or not the, the formation of the inner core really does increase the intensity dramatically, or does it, you know, uh, to what extent do we know for sure that <clears throat> you will see uh, a, an increase in intensity of, of the field when the inner core starts to form? I know that you know the modelers were slightly unsure which you know some modelers say it goes one way, some say it goes the other way. Yeah, I, I think it's still not um, 100% certain. 
because I mean, I think generally the, the consensus is that you would see an increase in intensity, certainly a change in the morphology of the field. Um, yeah, so it's 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 not um, it's not been decided that one. I don't think. But you guess it's um, it, it, I guess it is, it's more certain, is it, that you would you would see a low field prior just prior to it? Is it? I mean, that, that seems yeah. To be yeah, especially with a form and uh, the core forming so late, so the thermal strength has decreased so much. Uh, yeah. Okay.